Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambo channel. Well, XRP price, it's on the rise, up to almost 34 cents today. <laughs> awesome. It's going up. It, uh, gosh, it got down recently to closer to 29 cents, so hey, it's moving in the right direction. And it seems like the entire asset class is doing that today as well anyway. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And specifically, I uh, got some new charts on uh, the remittances on the XRP ledger. So I'm going to share those with you, the latest from Galgatron on that, including data on uh, account openings, wallets. Uh, also, this this was truly fascinating. I haven't really thought about this concept too much in, in, uh, you know, ever since I entered crypto, but uh, there's this idea of miners for Bitcoin and proof-of-work systems being middlemen, and there is a discussion. There's actually a piece I'm going to share with you in this video from AMB Crypto, and Ripple's CTO, XRP Ledger co-creator David Schwartz, jumps in and shares his uh, his opinion on the topic, and so I got some cool quotes from him on that. I'm also going to talk to you a little bit, uh, this isn't front page news, but um, I'm not sure many of you have heard a, a couple of things I'm going to share with you, but uh, it has to do with Western Union's potential adoption of uh, X-Rapid Technology partnering with Ripple, and I uh, got some comments from the, the CEO of Western Union on that topic, and it came up in the news again today, so I thought, yeah, you know what, I haven't really talked about it too much, and I'm not sure if everybody's even heard this, so I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, it's good stuff, definitely good stuff. And then I'll close out uh, this video with a piece from Coindesk about uh, whether or not President Trump can just straight up ban Bitcoin. If so, what would that look like and what would the uh, ramifications be of that? Before we get going, though, if you would please delicately tap that like button and go ahead and subscribe if you are a fan of Ripple and XRP. All right, to start here, market cap. Hey, it looks like we're about to break through 300 billion. We're at 297 billion right now. You got Bitcoin knocking on 11,000's door, and uh, like I said at the beginning of this video, XRP almost at 34 cents. And so I was—I actually clicked on this here to get a little closer look. And 24-hour uh, time window, actually not that bad. Uh, the lowest it's been in the last 24 hours is just shy of 32 cents. So not too shabby. All things looking good, heading in the right direction as the chart right. No, dictates right here, so you can see it visually stated. Looking good. So that's all in the right direction. And regardless, and I like how Galgatron kind of worded this, because you know in recent videos, I'm not going to talk about it in this video, but there's the whole uh, the whole controversy about, okay, what if Ripple went away uh, in terms of the validators? What would happen? It Would it halt the network, this or that? And uh, Galgatron kind of, I think he's kind of tweaking on that as he wrote this, but he wrote... Uh, latest charts, remittance size payment payments holding uh, its plateau like a champ, despite the ceaseless chanting of naysayers that the end of Ripple slash XRP is nigh. This chart shows the only reality there is. And you can see here is XRP chugging along, despite all of the discourse taking place on social media such as Twitter. And the one that I know Galgatron always likes to point out and specifically is remittances and payments between 10 and less than 500 United States dollars. And uh, the whole concept behind that is, again, of course, uh, you know, as adoption takes place, utilizing X Rapid, of course, uh, for for the purpose of remittances, you already know the types of uh, or the size payments that should be conducted on the ledger, uh, based on just the size of the transactions that go through remittance companies, such as MoneyGram, for example, or Mercury FX, or whoever it is, SendFriend, all of them. And so, as you see that type of activity occur on ledger here. And if it stays stable, especially outside of a, a price speculation, you know, uh, the, the ups and downs of volatility, if you see that the transactions are continuing to occur within this range, uh, that that is an indicator that there's actual real-world adoption. So you should see that kind of flatten out uh, over time as things progress. Now, of course, as there's... As there's again going to be, of course, I'm sure there'll be another parabolic run of XRP. That's my guess. It'll probably happen at some point. And when that happens, there will be such activity that the, the actual utility portion of this is going to be impossible to see at that point. And that's kind of the funny thing about it. The speculation can outstrip the visibility of the actual utility. But that is actually possible, and that can happen. But it's been a few days since Galgatron posted one of these, and the last one I shared with you, frankly, didn't look that different, but I know not everybody's watching every single one of my videos, and it's good news nonetheless, so I wanted to share it with you. And let me share with you the latest update on wallets. I always like looking at this one, just to visually show you, adoption of the XRP ledger doesn't stop. I don't care if the market's up or down, it doesn't stop. It's an endless trend upward. You know, because you can look in terms of uh, price action with XRP, you know what it looks like, a squiggly line that, yeah, the overall trend's up, but there are actually 
only moments where it goes down. Well, these are account openings, so they're never going to go down. This whole thing is up, up, up since the beginning of the XRP ledger existing. And so this is just looking over the last six months, but it just keeps going up. Of course, there's no down period, right? Just more accounts being created, and that is that. And, uh, you know, it's not that they can really truly be deleted, at least not currently. Actually, there, that's a different topic. That actually has come up in the past. I'm not going to cover it in this video. But especially with the reserves being what they are and the, the fact that they're required, uh, accounts are pretty much stuck after they're created because you have to hold XRP. But uh, it actually would be kind of fun to talk about that. I've never discussed that on this channel. But yeah, there's the idea of uh, del be, having the option to delete uh, XRP accounts. So I'll have to save that for another time since I'm not prepared for it. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, so look at this. You can see uh, right here, it's just continuing to... <clears throat> Climb on upwards here, and this part right here that I'm circling, uh, this was the big excitement occurring around mid-May for however long that period was. How long was it? Like a little month and a half or so, and then it's really started to ramp up, and then the increase slowed, but nonetheless still growing. So that's all this to show you that regardless of the price action occurring on the ledger, it's still just increasing. Look at that. It's like a straight line in, in an upward direction at this point. Look at that. I think that's cool. That just shows real-world adoption. It's going in that direction. Another reason that I choose to, one of many reasons that I choose to not freak out when uh, price is just doing what price does. But, uh, check out this piece now. This is from uh, this is from AMB Crypto, and it's titled Ripple's David Schwartz, Eamon Gunsur, I'm sure I butchered that, go head-to-head -head as community debates on whether Bitcoin miners are middlemen. So this is a brand new piece, and it starts out the price of Bitcoin has managed to push itself above $10,000 mark again. However, away from the market action, the Twitter community of Bitcoin saw an interesting discussion of some pre-perceived notions among people about Bitcoin miners. Angela Walsh, uh, professor and research fellow at UCL Center for Blockchain Technologies, laid out her reasons as to why people think Bitcoin miners, uh, including hashers, mining pool operators, and cloud mining companies, are not intermediaries. She also clarified that in her statements, Welch was referring to the layman's definition of the word intermediary, also known as middleman. However, there was a lot of debate around whether Bitcoin miners are middlemen or not. Ripple CTO David Schwartz joined the conversation at one point, to tell the researcher that Bitcoin miners do not have the right or duty to be middlemen, he explained. And this is, this is where it starts to get interesting. A middleman is someone who stands in the middle with some right or obligation to complete the transaction. Schwartz clarified his understanding of the role by giving the analogy of a paper plane flying in the wind, explaining that Bitcoin miners did not have any right, duty, or control to be a middleman. So Schwartz added, so here's another quote from him. The system is arguably a middleman. The miner who later discovers their block survived isn't. Is the internet provider a packet when over a middleman in online banking? And so, and you know, this is all fascinating to me in particular um, because if people think, if people might think, uh, especially somebody that created the XRP ledger, that, um, you, you know, like David Schwartz's interest and Bitcoin might not uh, be that great or that he thinks negative things about it, just this or that in general. And I wanted to point out that David Schwartz and the other creators, Arthur Brito and Jed, Jed McCaleb, who was actually a guy that actually came up with the idea for the extra pay ledger, uh, they were just they were early Bitcoiners, and so they saw an opportunity to improve upon the technology here. But the cool thing for me is when when uh, these guys, whatever they're made out to be, when they talk about uh, David Schwartz in particular, I'm thinking of when he talks about uh, this technology, uh, he just lays it out as he factually sees it, and you can see in the way that he speaks, he's, he's speaking from a tech-oriented perspective and a business perspective, and it's never about <clears throat> ideology or beliefs uh, behind that. You can you can see in the way that he speaks, he's just saying fundamentally transactionally here this is what the technology is actually doing and I, I certainly value that from him anyway anyway the piece continues according to the researchers definition miners could be middlemen as they they can censor order or delay transactions however due to the lack of rights obligations agreements and control they cannot be considered middlemen Soon, Emin Gunsur jumped in to say that miners do determine the content of a blockchain, as opposed to Schwartz's statement, Sir so added. So here's the opposing view. They voluntarily include transactions based on how much the users pay the miners with fees. They can censor. If 51% so choose, they can render certain addresses immobile, certain transactions unincludable in the chain. 
All right, and then the piece continues. However, the community could react with blinding transactions to this, so uh, even switch to proof of stake and change the mining algorithm or abandon Bitcoin, informed Ripple's CTO. It would be a catastrophic failure of the system if people abandon Bitcoin or even change the protocol, as that would no longer be Bitcoin. Sir responded back. Schwartz sealed the argument, however, after he informed Sir that there doesn't exist any rule that restricts evolution and changes in Bitcoin, concluding, There is no force, no authority. Bitcoin is whatever its stakeholders want it to be, and saying it's not Bitcoin anymore is sophistry and arbitrary line drawing. And that seems like a very rational response to me. It's just the re- part of the reason this is so entertaining to me is, um, you know, A and B crypto, they don't typically have outright, um, like, ridiculous and offensive uh, articles on XRP and Ripple, when compared to uh, Coindesk, for example, and there are some other ones out there that are more egregious. You, you can find some of that stuff here. I'm sure there are people that are writing stuff for AMB Crypto, and I've seen some stuff here and there. But it's fascinating, nonetheless, knowing that these people are more uh, interested in Bitcoin rather than XRP because just so many of them view it as this banker's coin, which is a whole stupid notion. I've spoken about that a lot. But it's fascinating to me that in this particular piece, in order to defend Bitcoin, they used arguments from XRP co-creator David Schwartz. That was enjoyable for me. I liked that. Okay, so now you like the points that David Schwartz has. Okay, I got you. That's cool. All right. All right, on to the next piece here. And again, this is not brand new news. This came out uh, right after MoneyGram was announced as an official partner using XRapid, uh, official Ripple customer here. But uh, there are a couple quotes that you may not have heard. And uh, and if you have, you know what? This is a good refresher anyway. I like this. This is cool. So anyway, this Pete starts out, and this is a cheesy joke. Ripple has been making ripples. And then he writes in parentheses, I'm so sorry. Well, you better be sorry. That's a stupid joke. (laughs) I'm kidding. I make dumb jokes all the time. That's basically what this channel is, is one big dumb joke. Anyway, so Ripple's been making ripples over the past year with new partnerships and fresh updates on its X-Rapid platform. Now Ripple is implementing an expansionist strategy that hasn't gone unnoticed in the business world. The San Francisco-based firm recently opened up some offices in Brazil, but has made it crystal clear that its goal is to become the leading company in blockchain solutions for the financial sector. Right, and let me jump down to here. So here's a piece that they reported on that, that was actually from Ethereum World News, and this states... Beyond Ripple's efforts to increase its presence in the banking industry, the startup's true strength could be in the business of cross-border remittances and the alternatives offered by certain fintechs to bank and to, to bank the unbanked. In this sense, businesses like Western Union, MoneyGram, Alipay, etc., have been associated as potential partners of Ripple in a world where banks have less prominence. And so, and then if you go down here, and, and in case you don't know, Western Union, they, they piloted Ripple software, the X Rapid, and then they came back and said that uh, didn't really save them a whole lot. You know, they, they, they really didn't. And it came down to their claim that they just have such efficient treasuries as it pertains to settlement that uh, it really wasn't a substantial improvement. Now, a couple things on that point, of course, they only did, what, a handful of tests? Was it like six tests or something like that? And so who knows under what parameters this took place and they, what they were comparing it to. And uh, some people, some entities in the remittance world become complacent. Uh, Western Union is gigantic. It can be scary uh, just conceptually to change everything that you're doing, especially when you have your own money in place and you know this works. And I, I get all that. But uh, even if, even if their treasuries were equivalently efficient to what X Rapid offers. They still have all that capital tied up in Nostro accounts the world over. It still won't make sense big picture for them to continue to have that money tied up as the rest of the world stops doing that as time passes because you, it's just not necessary to have that dormant capital sitting around anymore. It could be better put to use doing other stuff just in general here. And so I had theorized that you can only sit here and speculate as to why Western Union's response was what it was. And uh, is it simply that they didn't want their competitors to know they were actually interested in the software, um, and then they planned on potentially using it down the road, or were they genuinely still 
um, concerns. It's it's probably one. It's got to be one or the other, right? Uh, if they're still concerned, it doesn't mean that they would never jump on board with uh, with Ripple's technology utilizing X Rapid. But it's one of those things where there are always people that are first movers in the space, and if they have to be reactionary because their competition is becoming that much greater at uh, offering a better service at a lower price than relative to Western Union, maybe they will just have to be reactionary. Sometimes competitors are forced along just by their competition. That's pretty much it. And so something like that may very well be the case here. So if they have to be carried kicking and screaming in order for them to exist, so be it. We shall see how that all unfolds, though. But uh, anyway, on that topic, here's, here's what they state on this piece, and then I'm going to get to a quote from Western Union CEO here, which is fun, and then I'll wrap up this piece of the video. But anyway, um, after Western Union announced that Ripple's tech was not cost-effective for them, the firm behind XRP was given the green light a few days ago, which announced a strategic partnership with Western Union competitor MoneyGram, in which they acquired about 10% of the firm's shares. This is a decision that, of course, didn't go unnoticed by Western Union team, and on June 19th this year, the CEO of Western Union has confirmed that testing with Ripple never ceased and that the firm is still testing solutions based on XRP, XRapid, and other Ripple technologies. And so I wanted to point that out. Uh, yeah, this, this, this never did stop. Yes, they tested XRapid in the past, and they still are. They never said no to it. And you're about to find out just how much they're not saying no in just a moment here. Let me read this here. Uh, Hikmet Ursek said that he hasn't or wasn't opposed to the possibility of teaming up with Ripple at a time when favorable conditions are in place for both parties. And I remember seeing this. There's actually this is he was on stage. I saw a video clip of, of what I'm about to read to you here. But here, here's the quote from uh, Western Union CEO Hikmet Ursek. I just saw Brad coming to this meeting and I said, "Hey, Brad, you know I congratulated him to this deal. Obviously, MoneyGram needed something and Ripple needed something, and that sounds like a good deal. But for us, we are okay with our settlement system. But look, hey." I'm open at any cost savings, any innovation, I'm there, we can sign a deal tomorrow. So that sounds exactly what I was kind of leaning towards the case is, which is, hey, he said quite literally, we are okay with our settlement system. That's not like an overwhelming endorsement of his own setup, but he's like, we're okay with it. We're okay with it. He was like, but we can sign a deal tomorrow with Ripple. But we can do that. But we can. All right. So I just think it's one of those things they just didn't want to be the first to move. And it is quite possible that with the situation that MoneyGram was in, I mean, they almost got sold at one point. I think a deal fell through. Uh, they could have been in such a position where it's like, okay, we're, we've got to change something to moving forward. And so they were probably more likely to make a deal with Ripple anyway. But this is going to put... This is going to put Western Union in a tricky situation as corridors are built out. So I don't know initially how many corridors are going to be open for X Rapid as soon as, uh, as as soon as MoneyGram is actually utilizing it. But over time, as more corridors develop, uh, yeah, uh, that's it's obviously going to be more cost effective and uh, and faster. So traditional means for settlement are going to dry up over time. But this is this isn't going to happen overnight. So. Uh, as that happens, though, Western Union and other remittance companies will continue to feel the squeeze as these de these corridors are developed, and they're just going to have to jump on board or be left in the dust. That's pretty much it. All right, on to the last thing I wanted to cover in this particular video, and then I'll sign off here. This is a piece from Coindesk titled, Could Donald Trump Ban Bitcoin? All right, scary, scary. And the piece begins. Bitcoin yet again graced global headlines last week after the President of the United States, Donald Trump, took to Twitter to declare himself not a fan, quote, of cryptocurrencies whose value is highly volatile and based on thin air. The ensuing discussion largely celebrated the global attention and the fact that Bitcoin is now important enough for one of the most powerful men in the world to make a public statement about it. And the crypto markets seem to shrug it off, signaling with their relative indifference that they have bigger things to worry about. Now, that's certainly true. It didn't really seem to matter too much one way or another. So let me jump down here because I can only read so many parts of this. It's a somewhat lengthy piece here. But uh, there's a section titled uh, Code is Not Speech because the whole, th the whole thing comes down to, like, uh, can he do this and what would it look like? And... Um, so as it comes to, as far as like how we could squash this whole thing, like what would that look like? And so it says, code is not speech. It says, let's look at how we could do this. Many claim that a ban on using the Bitcoin code is a ban on civil liberties. Code is speech, the argument goes, and as such is protected by the First Amendment here in the United States. 
This is not nearly as clear as it seems. Contrary to popular opinion, there has been no official statement supporting the claim. The Bernstein case so often cited in which a judge upheld the claim that the government could not stop the publication of code was superseded by appeals and eventually dismissed without an official ruling. So a lot of this is uncharted territory, obviously, as we can see here. Uh, anyways, peace continues. While code may have some elements of speech and that it can be used to express and communicate, code is also very different. Unlike speech, it executes actions which can be and often are regulated by law with official enforcement. And that's very true. You may be uh, aware of the, the um, just the idea that you've got free speech but here in America, but you can't run into a, a crowded theater, for example. This is the example that's always cited and yell fire if there's no fire. That is illegal. And then you might be like, but then that's, that's infringing on my free speech. Well, no, this is where they draw the line, uh, and it is this. That is a call to action. That's, a, that's, the, that's what it's considered. When you're saying, hey, there's a fire in the theater and there's no fire, and you're scaring everybody and people can get trampled running out the doors, you, by saying that, are inciting, uh, it's, and it's, it's a call to action. Uh, but just stating stuff like, um, I, um, you know, I, I would like it if there's a fire in here, or I would not like it if there is a fire in here. You know, things like like that's that you can say that stuff, but when you're inciting people to move, that's where they draw the line. And so, um, in a comparative sense, here, yes, codes. That's what they're saying here. It's it's the same as if you're just putting opinion that uh, could somehow be incorporated into code as to it executing actions. There could be a difference there, and that's why this seems like uncharted territory because. You know, you already differentiate in some ways, like I just cited, uh, as far as it pertains to language. When it comes to this type of technology, it hasn't exactly been broached yet. But anyway, the piece continues here. Also, writing code as a form of expression itself is as harmless as speaking your mind, but Bitcoin users aren't writing code. They are executing it. They are taking an action which could theoretically be declared illegal. And given the public blockchain's transparency, this would not be impossible to enforce. Given the size and reach of the U.S. market, its absence from the Bitcoin ecosystem would be felt, and not just in the price. Fungibility would come into question. The risk of accepting a Bitcoin that a few hops ago was in a U.S.-based wallet could lead to the emergence of parallel markets for verifiably clean coins. And the risk of inadvertently sending a payment to a United States-based person or entity could push uh, transactions into more expensive and even more traceable vehicles. And so, and actually, I'm going to talk about that in a different video, but the idea of verifiably clean coins, that came up in another piece from today, and I plan to cover that in a different video, but i got to be wrapping this one up here in a minute here. But, uh, so anyway, it, and it continues. So, like, what, what would this look like if Trump were actually going to ban Bitcoin how would he do it here? And, uh, and they kind of get into it. I don't know if you've heard this concept, but let me just read one more part of this. And, uh, and then I'm, I'm curious as to what you think. Feel free to drop comments below. But uh, size and might is the section of this uh, name of this section of the piece. If Trump is persuaded that going after the Bitcoin protocol would be futile, he could still decide to clamp down on cryptocurrency businesses. While it is difficult to stop independent enterprises from handling assets that are not illegal, the imposition of a slew of compliance and fiscal requirements could render such projects no longer viable. And as we saw with the handling of the United States' approach to Iran sanctions, the threat of retaliation against any company, no matter its jurisdiction, that violated the ban or trade, it is possible that an aggressive stance from the issuer of the world's reserve currency could force other sovereign nations to capitulate. Yes, that is true. Uh, in other words, in the face of the United States clampdown, Bitcoin would not disappear. Its code and operation are decentralized, and the advantages of the technology will always give it some demand, but its potential could be curtailed. Yep, uh, that's exactly correct. So, uh, I, look, I, I don't think that any of this is going to happen because you, you won't. I think that there would be a, a, a down, downfall in terms of adoption of crypto, perhaps in the short term, for how long that would go, go on, I don't know. But I, I don't know that it would be forever if the rest of the world um, doesn't, doesn't ban all of it. So what would actually happen is all the innovation would just move overseas and the United States would be left behind in a number of ways. And that would be uh, economically quite bad. Definitely economically not, not the ideal situation. And if anything, it would just give the rest of the world another reason to try and, try and quit or when it's possible to try and quit using the United States dollar as the world's reserve currency. So we don't want that. But anyway, well, if you're in the United States, maybe you don't. I don't know. 
I'm just saying stuff. So. Let me close out by showing you this little picture. I actually meant to show you this yesterday. This is from Mac Attack, Attack XRP, and I thought it would be a fun way to close out here. Just uh, shared this little image here. Yeah, you guys ever watch Back to the Future smash hit movie from the mid-1980s with Michael J. Fox? Well, here's a picture of the cover, and then they got uh, Brad Garlinghouse on Michael J. Fox's face. And what's uh, what Doc Brown's? Uh, he's the character in the movie. What's is that? Christopher Lloyd? I could be wrong, but I'm going from memory. I think I think that's the name. I'm sorry if I'm wrong. Anyway, so they got that, and then it says because you know the time travel thing with part two. Remember, Doc Brown says roads where we're going we don't need roads that's what it says in the movie or maybe it's at the end of the first one whatever so here it says nostro accounts where we're going we don't need nostro accounts so, <laughs> a little dorky a little nerdy but i still like it i think it's funny but uh that's that's all i got for you for this one i am not a financial advisor do not buy or sell anything because of anything that i say or write that would be a very 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 bad idea until next time to the moon lambo